week, Evanescence by David Redstone. Exterior, deck rail, World War II Japanese destroyer, late afternoon. A young Japanese officer, 20s, stands against the rail and peers through binoculars at the calm sea. Oil! Oil! A senior Japanese officer, 30s, looks through his own binoculars. Where? The young officer points to an area on the surface. There! As the senior officer sights down the line of the man's arm. He then raises and focuses his binoculars. An oil slick appears through the lenses. Yes, I, can, I see it. He turns to face the captain up on the bridge deck. We hit them, Commander. The captain motions to the bridge officer, who holds a bullhorn. He takes the bullhorn from him and clicks it on. We have hit the Americans. Congratulations, men. Men on deck cheer and wave their arms. On a nearby destroyer, officers and crew also celebrate. Interior, bridge, U.S. submarine, late afternoon. The red-lit, steeply angled bridge is a scene from hell. Pressurized water sprays from various pipes and fixtures. Explosions erupt across navigational gear along bulkheads. The shrieking cacophony is punctuated by bangs and pops. A sonar scope shatters. Glass from smaller gauges crack, then shards explode out. A flying glass sliver buries itself into a man's cheek. He grabs at his face, loses grip on a deck-mounted swivel chair, and tumbles into the down-angled forward bulkhead. A depth meter needle passes 350 feet. Huge vibrations rock the bridge. Two men lose their footing and slide down to the forward bulkhead. Seawater jets through the seal around the closed aft hatch. Half a dozen men, mouths open, cling to equipment handles, cables, and table edges. All struggle to cover their ears. The sub's down angle increases sharply. The aft hatch breaks free and a cascade of seawater roars through the opening. The hatch cover plows into the captain near the periscope. He's driven into a mass of bodies at the forward bulkhead. The red battle lights flicker, then the bridge goes black. Exterior, ocean. The stricken boat plunges in a slow motion cartwheel. Blue-white sparks suddenly form around the sail of the submarine as it tumbles downward. A blue-white electrified outline spreads across and around the submarine and pulses for several seconds. The light flickers out and the sub disappears into blackness. A wrenching squeal rises from the depths as the hull crushes. Then silence. Fade to black. Exterior, forecourt, Grauman's Chinese Theater, morning. Current day, it's warm and sunny at this famous Hollywood landmark. A young couple, early 20s, crouches around the Star Trek square of handprints and footprints. He's Derek Garnett, fit, very good looking. She's Crystal Janelli, model looks. A tourist points a camera phone at them. The tourist clicks a button, then hands the phone back to Crystal. Thank you so much. Derek frowns as he glances at a group on the forecourt. He opens his cell phone, then closes it. Again. We need to get going. Come on. Can we relax for even one minute? We have to be at the canvas by... Terrific people! He's using a stopwatch on our vacation. A few tourists look their way and smile. Well, it's a working vacation. They come together and walk towards the street. Wait, you almost made me forget. Crystal grabs his arm and leads him back to the forecourt. Our faves, right? You first. Where was she? Back there. They go to Natalie Woods Square. Derek hurriedly crouches. Once again, he glances around and frowns, then faces Crystal. She snaps a picture. Oh, wow. Dazzling smile. What's up? Nothing. Where's Carrie Grant? That way. At Grant Square, Crystal goes down to a knee and smiles. She looks off to a group of tourists and drops her smile. Oh, my God. There he is again. There's who? I thought someone was... Never mind. Just go ahead. Crystal poses quickly, and Derek takes the photo. She straightens up and grabs his arm. That was no Julia Roberts smile. Come on, let's get away from here. I've been saying that all along. They hurry onto the sidewalk, then towards an intersection. Crystal looks back anxiously as they cross the street. Interior, taxi, 405 freeway south, late morning. Ray Kelvin, blonde, early 20s, good looks, sits up front. The taxi paces a yellow Mustang. A freeway sign appears, Bellflower Boulevard, half mile. The Mustang maintains its speed in lane position. Should I exit? No. Keep following. Interior, Mustang. 405 freeway south. Continuous. Derek grips the steering wheel hard and pushes back. The wheel slips. The car swerves. He instantly corrects it. Crystal looks at him sharply, then faces forward. Derek's lips move as if he's speaking. No sound comes out. He stares ahead, unblinking, very intense. Interior, taxi. 405 freeway south. Continuous. The Mustang goes right past the freeway exit ramp. He's supposed to jump off here. Okay, keep pacing him until... Sir, look. Interior, Mustang, 405 freeway south, continuous. 
Derek abruptly spins the wheel to the right. The tires impact a raised apron bordering the exit lane. The Mustang goes airborne, then slams down onto the apron. The left front fender nudges a water-filled crash barrel. It half spins, topples, and rolls down into the right lane. A tractor trailer nails the barrel and it pops like a water balloon. The truck veers into the next lane over. Vehicles in the two right lanes swerve. Horns blast, brakes screech, and blue smoke clouds rise from skidding tires. The Mustang jumps off the apron, cuts into the off-ramp lane, and nearly crashes into another car. Interior, Mustang, Bellflower Boulevard, exit, continuous. Crystal rocks in the seat as Derek struggles with the wheel. What the fuck are you doing? Derek pumps the brakes. The Mustang slows, and he finally gets it under control. The car they almost hit passes by on the left. The old man driver gives him the finger out of his window. He's right, you almost killed us. Sorry, I got distracted. Jesus, I don't want to die in California, okay? The Mustang crawls towards the green light ahead while the old man makes his left turn easily. The light changes to yellow, then red. Derek flips on his right turn signal and stops. I thought you were in a hurry. Exterior, intersection, Bellflower Boulevard exit, continuous. A homeless man, late thirties, dirty and shabby, starts to cross. He reaches the front of their car and pauses. The man shambles back over to the passenger side, aims a spray bottle at the windshield, and squeezes. Interior, Mustang, Bellflower Boulevard, intersection, continuous. The man squints his eyes to slits at Crystal. He focuses on her as he applies a ball of soggy newspaper to the glass. Crystal fixates on him as he shuffles in front of their car. He comes to Derek's door, then thrusts a blackened hand through the open window. For the trouble? Derek pulls a bill from his shirt pocket and offers it. The man snatches the bill and winks. He eyeballs Crystal a moment, then slowly backs away. I wish you'd have scored the paint off this stupid car. What a creep. Creep? Chris, he's homeless. I don't mean because of that. I've seen homeless. Just forget it. The light turns green, but their car stays put. A horn beeps from behind. Derek turns onto Bellflower Boulevard. You didn't see him looking me over? Like I'm an animal in a zoo? I was watching traffic. Of course you were. Crystal removes a phone from her purse, presses some buttons, and holds it to her ear. She smiles as she closes the phone and puts it away. Big day for Uncle T. Lucky girl. How come? She gets to be wined and dined by a genuine Navy SEAL. When does he want us there again? Around 2 o'clock, 2.30. That's tight. We still have the Aerotail, then our yacht at 6. He's family, hun. It's just for an hour or so. Couldn't we go tomorrow morning? He's driving to Carmel, early. But that cuts it awfully close today, so maybe... Then you stay in the room and I'll take a cab. I'm seeing him this afternoon. End of story. They pass a green sign on the right. UCLB campus. All right. I'll go. As long as he doesn't kick my ass. That was years ago. Whomever he did that to deserved it. Hey, everybody loves my Uncle Tom. Derek drives straight through at the campus intersection. Are we going in another way? What? I thought we'd turn here. Oh, shit. Derek cuts into the turn lane and stops at the next light. What's wrong? Nothing. Bullshit. I missed the turn. So what? You've been away from me ever since we boarded the plane in Wichita. It's your imagination. You're acting fucking weird. Well, maybe it's this conference. You don't know my boss. That thing's not till Wednesday. I have to go over some new stuff. Screw your boss and his conference. Derek makes a sharp, fast U-turn when the light changes. Interior, taxi, Bellflower Boulevard, continuous. Ray and the driver coast toward the intersection of University of California, Long Beach, UCLB. Ray spots the Mustang and scrunches down in the seat. The light changes. The Mustang turns into the campus drive. All right. Go through and then hang a right at the next street up. Exterior, taxi, road from Bellflower Boulevard, continuous. I should be back in an hour. If not, then take off, okay? He hands the driver several bills and walks away. Thank you, sir. Interior, taxi, road from Bellflower Boulevard, continuous. The driver stuffs the cash into his shirt pocket. He glances in his side view mirror. It reflects Ray as he walks towards Bellflower Boulevard. The driver reaches over, resets the meter, then straightens up and again looks into the mirror. He frowns and sticks his head out of the window. The sidewalk is empty. Exterior, walkway, UCLB campus, continuous. Crystal aims her camera phone at a huge blue pyramid. Beautiful. What's it used for? Sports, basketball, sports, basketball mostly, concerts. People emerge from buildings and start to crowd onto the walkway as classes break. Derek points ahead. Engineering. Crystal steps onto the grass and aims her phone at the engineering buildings. On the phone screen, Ray Kelvin passes Derek on the walkway and continues towards her. Crystal looks up. 
Their eyes lock. Ray then looks down and quickens his pace as he passes her. Derek discovers Crystal isn't with him. He stops, turns around, and a student nearly collides with him. Crystal catches up to Derek, grabs his arm. Hey, what's the matter? I saw him again. Him? The guy at the Chinese theater. Which one? Who? Derek darts his eyes around, apprehensive, worried. Crystal backtracks along the walkway and scans the moving clusters of students. Derek joins up with her. Who is this guy? He recognized me. Crystal searches for a few seconds more, then gives up. Derek takes her hand and they continue up campus. At the theater, I felt someone was watching me. I'm pretty sure I saw him when we did Cary Grant. Well, what do you look like? Sad, blue eyes, decent looking. It's funny. As they enter, as they near the engineering buildings, Derek points. Aerospace Hall. Funny. I've seen him before. Yeah, you said that at the theater. Before that. But if he knows me, why doesn't he introduce himself? He probably just looks like someone else you know. Come on. Why do we know each other all the way out here? You and my uncle. There he is. Derek lets go of her hand and rushes forward. Exterior, Aerospace Hall, UCLB campus, continuous. Professor Taranto, 40s, sits on a bench outside Aerospace Hall. He smiles and stands as Derek approaches. They shake hands, then Derek looks around for Crystal. She walks towards them with exaggerated nonchalance. Great to see you. This is my... Chris, hey, come on. Uh, my fiancé, Crystal Ginelli, and this is Professor Taranto. Taranto slowly appraises her head to toe as they shake hands. Crystal picks up on it. Hello. Pleasure to meet you, Miss Ginelli. Crystal, thank you. Did you guys take a taxi here? No, we rented this. Derek opens his phone to show him a picture of their Mustang. Professor Taranto takes a long look. Very nice. So you're here for the airframe conference? Yeah, well, Chris wanted to see the area and visit her uncle, too. Actually, Derek insisted I come. Well, I'm happy he did. You're in WISI, right? Uh-huh. Testing a new composite. WISI? What's WISI? Wing structures, surfaces, and integrity. He never tells me anything. We're modeling uh, vertical drag and wing slats during landing. A new carbon fiber composite down in the physical test research lab. Mr. Propellerhead, I'll be at the Blue Pyramid. You guys catch up and geek out while I'm gone. Professor Taranto glances at Derek and nods very slightly. Cool. We'll be done in a few. Exterior, Aero Aerospace Hall, UCLB campus continuous. Ray Kelvin hangs out near the building front and absently pages through a newspaper. Professor Taranto gives Derek a black velvet bag. Derek pockets it. They speak softly. Ray strains to listen while trying to act casual. He overhears the word, goddess. Ray watches Professor Taranto scribble on a pad, rip out the page, and hand it to Derek, who quickly folds and pockets it. Crystal joins them. She and Derek shake hands with the professor. Then they start down campus on the walkway. Exterior walkway, UCLB campus continuous. Derek and Crystal walk at a fast pace. Then Derek slows and quickly glances over his shoulder. A latch. You should velcro a sponge onto his chin. The professor? No, he's cool. I'm telling you. He'd have taken me right there on that bench. I didn't notice a thing. I know. Are we leaving? Derek looks behind him again. Yeah. Good, I'm starved. Crystal opens her purse and drops the phone inside it. Someone... Someone's following us. Derek quickly pivots in front of Crystal to step onto the grass. He knocks her purse to the ground. She bends down to pick up items that spilled out. Thanks a lot. Hey, Derek backpedals along the grass and scans the walkway. He sees Ray Kelvin. Their eyes meet, then Ray takes off. Exterior, grassy area, UCLB campus, continuous. Ray looks over his shoulder as Derek chases him. He heads towards the Performing Arts Center, then changes direction and sprints for the Blue Pyramid. Derek matches Ray's pace, just 20 yards behind. Exterior, walkway, UCLB campus, continuous. A female security guard, 30s, drives a cart across the grass. A male security guard, 20s, sits next to her. Exterior, Blue Pyramid Apron, UCLB campus, continuous. Ray veers to the right. His feet skitter and he loses balance. Then he falls and slides out of control. A potted small tree set into the concrete stops him abruptly. Ray holds his right hand side as he tries to stand. Derek pushes Ray down into the pot. He grabs Ray's collar and looks sharply into his eyes. You're one of them, aren't you? He shakes Ray roughly. I don't know you. Who are you? Exterior, grassy area, UCLB campus, continuous. The security cart rolls towards the Blue Pyramid apron. 
Crystal runs towards Ray and Derek. Is it him? Exterior, blue pyramid, apron, UCLB campus, continuous. Derek turns his head towards Crystal. Ray raises both his legs and kicks Derek's chest. Derek crashes back into two Asian students behind. All three fall in a heap. Ray extricates himself from the tree pot, gets up and runs towards a corner of the blue pyramid. The security cart swerves and closely follows him. Exterior, vending machine area, UCLB campus, continuous. Ray tears around the corner of the blue pyramid, then darts between a Coca-Cola machine and a candy machine. He faces outwards and folds his arms. The security cart races in, then stops. The guards jump out. Where? How'd you have come in here? Probably behind one of those. I'll clear this area, right? Cool. I'll check the front. He runs to the front apron of the blue pyramid. The woman detaches a mace cylinder from her belt. She checks in between and behind several vending machines. No need to hide, sir. You're not in trouble. Let's just talk, if that's okay with you, sir. She leans in between the Coca-Cola and candy machines. Suddenly, she straightens up and freezes. The woman frowns, then moves off. Scared, she rapidly checks the rest of the vending machine spaces. Just before she gets into the cart, the woman turns and walks to the space between the Coca-Cola and candy machines. Sir? Finally, she climbs into the security cart and drives off. Exterior, blue pyramid apron, UCLB campus continuous. The male guard stands near two Asian students who are knocked over with Derek. The female guard pulls the cart close to him. Cleared. He pulled a cast for us. Uh, this other guy and the woman took off down campus. Vanished. It's not even Halloween yet. Okay, you drive and I'll report in. Interior, rear torpedo room, aerotail submarine, late afternoon. Aerotail is a Cold War era Russian submarine docked next to the Hotel RMS Queen Georgina in Long Beach, California. Crystal and Derek step through a hatch and look around at various displays, gauges, and tour information panels. You ready? Yeah, I've seen enough. Derek climbs up a vertical ladder towards an open hatch. Crystal follows. She glances at three empty bunks stacked alongside the bulkhead, then continues up. Derek's legs disappear through the hatch above. He repositions himself and looks back down into the hatchway. He extends a hand down towards Crystal. As she climbs up, Crystal glances again down at the bunks. A burly man, early twenties, in old navy dungarees and sailor cap, materializes on the middle bunk. He lies on his side, arms folded. The man smiles and winks at Crystal. Her foot slips off a rung. She shouts, then the other foot slips. She grabs the ladder rail but starts to slide down. Chris! Her right hand catches a rung, then her foot clangs as it hits a rung. She regains balance a few feet above the deck. Crystal looks at Derek, then at the bunk. The man is gone. She shakes her head and climbs up fast, then grabs Derek's hand. He helps her through the hatchway. Interior, cabin suite, Queen Georgina, early evening. Crystal lies on her back upon a king-size bed. He had two moles on his neck. Huh? I said, can we take a scenic drive along the coast? Derek comes to the bathroom doorway with a hand towel. A dry. I'm so jet-lagged, I'm seeing things. Let's go to a beach and just walk around. Derek strides across the room and points out the porthole. I don't feel like being on a damn boat, hon. Can we call it a day? Derek stays put. Crystal groans, slowly gets off the bed, and drags herself to the porthole. Reminds me of the river back home. The sun sets in about an hour. Let's go up on deck by the smoke sacks and watch it from there. Well, I paid for a chartered yacht. Fine. Money down the drain. We'll drive to Laguna instead. It's just... Things have been so crazy and I just want to cool down. I did see your uncle, babe. I knew it was important to you. Okay. Okay, the boat it is. You sure? Uh-huh. I'm taking a nap first. Derek pulls out his phone and looks at the screen. Yeah, that works. I'll go to the dock and check out the boat. How long? Half an hour. She kisses him, then jumps onto the bed and gets under the covers. Should I turn out the lights? Don't, or I'll never wake up. Be back in the gym. Sleep fast. Crystal does an exaggerated snore. Interior, passageway, Queen Georgina, continuous. Derek closes the door and walks towards the elevators. He opens his phone, clicks a button, speaks in a low voice. All the paperwork will be in the back seat. No. No. She doesn't. A latch. That's right. See you in about 15. Bye. Exterior, yacht, Long Beach Marina, early evening. A man and woman, 50s, lounge on the open deck. They sip drinks and watch the setting sun. The boat next to them suddenly dips down near the stern, as if someone was stepped aboard. Its deck is empty. Interior, passageway, Queen Georgina, continuous. 
Crystal yawns as she and Derek walk towards the elevators. You'll wake up on the yacht. She catches her reflection in the hallway mirror. God, I look like hell. You're gorgeous. And you're sweet. What's the boat's name? Goddess Melissa. No fooling? Up to text Melissa when we get back. At the elevator, Crystal presses the down button. Derek reaches into his pocket. Damn it. What now? My phone. Sorry. He half trots to their cabin suite door and pauses. Derek looks back down the passageway at Crystal. She does a look at the time gesture and shakes her head. He opens the door and slips inside. Interior, cabin suite, Queen Georgina, continuous. Derek clicks the light switch and slowly scans the room. He goes to the porthole to view the Long Beach Marina across the channel. After a moment, he heads toward the nightstand. Derek catches his reflection through the open bathroom door. He stops, lowers his eyes, then continues to the nightstand. He removes his phone from a drawer. From his back pocket, Derek pulls out a note and places the corner of it under the room telephone. Handwritten words read, Staff, we have a family emergency and had to leave immediately to catch a flight. Please pack our belongings and charge our card and mail them to... He takes a 20 from his wallet and lays it on top of the note. At the door, Derek gives the suite a final once-over, then flicks the light switch and leaves. Interior, cabin, Nakima, early evening. Nakima's bow faces Queen Georgina across the channel. A few sailboats and yachts move slowly in the waterway. Ray Kelvin scans Queen Georgina with night vision binoculars, then sweeps across several watercraft cruising near her. He stops and angles the lenses down. A yellow car moves on the roadway adjacent to Queen Georgina. Ray runs to the aft ladder and goes up. Exterior, stern deck, Nakima continuous. Ray focuses on a yellow Mustang through his binoculars. The man and woman on the yacht next to Nakima notice him. Ahoy there! Where are you sleeping? Ray ignores them and hurries down the stern ladder. The man and woman look at each other, confused. Exterior gangway, Queen Georgina, continuous. Derek and Crystal step off the sidewalk. She turns left, but Derek emphatically steers her right. The yacht's this way. I'm so used to going to the car, our butt-ugly yellow car. She looks out across the parking lot. Hey, I can't see it. Come on, we're late. Exterior walkway adjacent to Queen Georgina, continuous. Crystal and Derek pass Queen Georgina and the Russian sub. She glances uneasily at the submarine as they walk by. That's her. He points to a yacht tied to a pier, its engines idling. Exterior, pier, goddess Melissa, continuous. Crystal smiles as she steps onto the yacht's stern deck. Brad McKitterick, 19, red hair, blue eyes, holds out a hand and Crystal grabs it to steady herself. Welcome aboard. Thanks. Captain McKirk is my name, but call me Brad. Just don't call me late for dinner. <laughs> That's original. I'm Crystal. I like it. Well, let's get a move on before we lose that sun. Derek, you want us to cast off? Derek unties the line and then steps aboard. Interior, cabin, goddess Melissa continuous. Derek and Crystal walk by a table upon which rest trays of hors d'oeuvres and two bottles of wine. They grab appetizers and continue forward, next to Brad. Help yourself, guys, and anything you need, just sing it out. Ready? The yacht gently pulls away and into the channel. Let's go up on deck. We'll be back there, Captain. Okay. Mind your step, folks. Exterior, stern deck, goddess Melissa continuous. The setting sun lights up Queen Georgina like a postcard. This really is worthwhile seeing. Derek and Crystal clink wine glasses and watch the sunset. Brad's an art, don't you think? Seems really, really mature. <laughs> That's why they uh, hired him. We'll keep in touch online. Suddenly, the yacht stops and the engine shut off. Derek pulls out his phone and looks at the time. Crystal makes some playful grabs for the phone. Interior, cabin, Nakima, continuous. Ray scans boats in the marina channel with binoculars. Bright, silvery flashes flicker in the windows of a yacht. Ray focuses. The upper halves of two silvery men walk through the boat's cabin towards the stern. He focuses on the bridge and witnesses Brad turn silvery. Rips up, Ray rips off the binoculars and flings them onto the seat. Exterior, stern deck, goddess Melissa, continuous. Crystal moves to the ladder and bends down. Brad! Yo-ho, Captain Brad. I wonder what's going on. Is this part of the cruise? We just float around now? Exterior, stern deck, Nakima, evening. A shimmering, silvery ray emerges from the stern ladder. He dashes to the rail and stands above the Long Beach skyline. A low-pitched hum starts. The man and woman on the adjacent yacht see and hear nothing. Exterior, night sky, city of Long Beach, continuous. 
A point of light rapidly grows in size. The low-pitched hum increases in volume. The light grows larger and becomes a long, glowing object that descends as it angles to raise left. Exterior, stern deck, Nakima, continuous. The glowing object draws closer. Silvery ray twists around to glimpse goddess Melissa. Two silvery men on her deck also watch the glowing object. Interior, cabin, goddess Melissa, continuous. Silvery Brad stands at the foot of the stern ladder. On the top step, Crystal looks down and right through him. She descends the ladder rapidly. Brad barely has time to back up and moves off to the side. You here? Is something wrong? She turns and sees Derek near the ladder above. Maybe he's in the bathroom. Crystal walks to the cabin table and refills her wine glass. She sips wine and looks directly through the spot where Brad stands. She then returns to the ladder and climbs up. Exterior, stern deck, Nakima, continuous. Silvery Ray watches the glowing object in full profile as it slowly banks toward the marina channel. It's a large, multi-gun warship, World War II era. He spins around and scrambles down the ladder. Interior, cabin, Nakima, continuous. Silvery Ray starts Nakima's engine. He backs her out of the berth, turns, and speeds down the center of the marina. A boat obstructs his path ahead. Ray veers right at the last moment. The boat bounces away from his wake. What are you doing, jerk off? She's puzzled. No one is visible inside the cabin. On moored boats, people shout profanities as Nakima passes. Ray reaches the end of the marina lane and banks right. Exterior, marina channel, above Goddess Melissa, continuous. The warship, with 88 on its hull near the bow, moves slowly just above the surface. It bears down on Goddess Melissa. The low-pitched hum steadies. No screws turn, no shafts rotate on the warship. Ray swings Nakima over and heads for the yacht. The warship hovers several feet above the water alongside Goddess Melissa. The two glowing cargo nets drop over the ship's side. A coil of rope falls from her deck. Exterior, stern deck, Goddess Melissa, continuous. A splash sound behind the yacht's stern. Did Brad throw that? Brad? Hey, Brad? Crystal suddenly falls backwards towards the stern ladder. Hun, what? The half-full wine glass flies out of her hand and overboard. Hey! Crystal floats several feet above the deck. She rocks slightly back and forth. Put me the fuck down! Hun! Crystal screams as she swings out from the yacht over the starboard side. She disappears in midair. Her screams cut off. What? Chris! Derek steps toward the starboard side. He suddenly floats up jerkily and struggles. He falls, then hovers a few feet above the deck. An unseen force thrusts Derek over the starboard rail, and he winks out. Exterior, cargo net, Rexville, continuous. The net raises quickly. Four sailors hold Derek down as he struggles in it. They pin his arms and legs. Derek sees Nakima gently bump the side of Goddess Melissa through the cargo net's mesh. Exterior, Hermosa Avenue, Hermosa Beach House, night. Ray pounds on a front door. After a moment, he draws back his fists to knock again. The door bursts open. Tom Gilmore, forties, fit, stands silhouetted in the doorway. You're early, Sabrina. Who the hell are you? May I speak with you, sir? I asked who you are. The name is Ray Kelvin. Tom Gilmore, what's your pitch? I need to talk to you about your niece, right now. I have a whole canyon full of nieces. Well, this is about Crystal. Okay, that was a test. She's my only niece. What do you want to do, marry her? Too late, pal. Look, this is goddamn important. Can I come in? Tom stands aside and dramatically ushers him through. I've got a date on the way over, so you'd better double time it. Interior, living room, Tom's house, continuous. The room is expensively decorated, wood paneled, large. Want a drink? No thanks. So, mister... Nobody calls me mister. Tom, you and I are leaving right now. Oh, we are. Hey, come on back here. Take a load off for a second. Ray walks further in and sits on a chair at a polished wood table. He's antsy. Tom goes behind a bar and opens the refrigerator. Nice place. Real estate is some kind of racket, eh? Cola? Ginger ale? How about a frosted mug of almond cream lager? Nothing. What's this about Crystal? How old are you, Tom? You answered me with a question. How old? Older than hydrogen. You a private detective? Anyway, I'm 44. Tom comes to the table. He swigs a beer and puts it down. And how do old do you think I am, Ray? Tom sits down across from Ray. With that peach fuzz? Come on, have a brewski with me. Christ's sakes, I won't turn you in. I give my... God damn it, Gilmore. There's no time for this shit. How old am I? 21. With a smart-ass yap. Good guess. I was born in 1924. Thank you. What? 1924. Oh, well, that makes you, um... 
What's your secret? Tangerine tofu yogurt, organic water. Listen up. Crystal's in danger and we have to leave ASAP. Now you can just sit there and keep your... Hold it! My niece is in danger? Yes! Just give me 30 seconds to convince you I'm for real, and then we'll go get her. Deal? Tom jumps to his feet. The hell kind of danger? Is she alive? Is she safe? For the moment. But we need to get started on it. So you're the kidnapper. <laughs> or one of them. What's your price, you mother f Tom starts to move around the table. Stop it! I want to save her. Ray's desperate tone halts Tom in his advance. Please. Please let me show you what you're up against, all right? Would you sit back down? We're wasting valuable time. Tom retreats to the chair and sits. He picks up his beer. Okay. Bring it on, Grandpa. Just sit there quietly and walk. Ray leans back in his chair. He folds his arms and a second later, he winks out. Tom's mouth opens. He stands. His beer drops to the floor. The bottle crashes and breaks. Ray reappears, arms folded. Tom falls back into his chair. Holy shit! D do you... is that... light bending? No. What then? Okay, it must be... Uh, it's... Uh, your... take me to your leader? Not E.T. An earthling like you. What the hell is left? Vampire? Zombie? Or else... Casper? Close enough. I died in a diesel submarine. Or... I thought I died. You were a bubblehead. <laughs> and you're a badass seal. We heard all about you guys. Tom, we have to fly to St. Louis now, if we hope to save Crystal. From what? From those like me. Tom, stay seated. You have no alternative. Just call one. Call the cops. Out of the question. FBI? Why not the military? I know a few Navy people. They cannot reach her. I can. Ray stands. Trust an old man's wisdom. Tom hesitates. What's the full story here? It's complicated. I'll tell you everything on the plane. This is too fucking crazy. Want to see Crystal again? Tom, um, she's the daughter I'd wish for. All right, Gramps. I don't suppose you brought your flying carpet. Sorry. Um, damn, I forgot your name. Ray. Ray Kelvin. I'll see what's going to St. Lou, or we'll get a charter. Tom gets up and moves off down the hallway into a bedroom. Ray walks to a wall of military memorabilia in the main room. He focuses on a large brass insignia, an eagle clutching an anchor, pistol, and trident, the U.S. Navy SEAL insignia. Tom, toting a backpack, taps Ray on the shoulder. Why did you leave? Setting up a flight. What else? No. The SEALs. You left early. They, uh, discovered I had an inborn fear of water. Delta leaves in 55 minutes, so let's go. Do you have guns here? Weapons? I could hold off Hermosa's finest for a year. We'll need whatever you can bring. Flying isn't like the 40s, Ray. We have cavity searches now. Cavities? Yep. You'll love it. Come on. Tom switches off the lights, grabs his backpack, and they leave. Exterior, glowing jetliner, night, dream sequence. Music plays, a song by the Andrews sisters, Don't Sit Under the Apple Tree With Anyone Else But Me. Crystal in a billowy white dress hangs off the wing edge of a silvery jetliner. It gently rolls to the right. Crystal screams. Her bare legs come off the wing. The jet steadies, then dips to the right at a sharper angle. One of Crystal's hands slips off the wing edge, then the other. She falls as the jet speeds up and away. She tumbles through the air and goes into a headfirst dive. Below is a deep blue sea. Black, leafless trees grow from it. The curling, jagged branches reach up as Crystal drops down. Shiny black apples bloom instantly on the trees. She screams again, cringes as she's about to land upon a branch. Interior, officer's cabin, Brexville, night. Crystal lies on her side in the lower of a two-tiered bunk. She opens her eyes to a white wall six inches away. Don't sit under the apple tree ends. Another tune starts up. Glenn Miller's Moonlight Serenade. Crystal sits up. Better fetch the skipper. A door opens, then closes. Crystal twists around. Brad McKitterick sits at a gray metal desk across the cabin. He wears old-style navy dungarees. You? What? Hi, Crystal. Where's Derek? We were on a... He's in another cabin. You okay? Crystal springs off the bunk and yanks open the door. A huge sailor stands in her way. Crystal backs up as he comes into the cabin and shuts the door. He whirls around to face Brad. What the fuck is this? Brad looks away from her. You kidnapped us? You're pirates? No. Bullshit. She steps towards Brad. The big sailor grabs her shoulders. 
Crystal struggles to break free, and the sailor gets her right arm twisted behind her back. I don't have any money, and neither does my fiancé. The door opens. Two officers enter the cabin. One is Lieutenant Brian Grenache, late twenties. The other is Captain Alexander Bertrell, mid-thirties, authoritative, intense. My navigator, Lieutenant Grenache, ma'am. Bertrell goes to the porthole, lights of a town stream past. Out there is Tucumari, New Mexico, our, one, our thousand mile checkpoint. You're the ringleader behind this kidnapping? I'm Alexander Bertrell, commanding officer, USS Bruxville. Welcome aboard. He offers his hand to Crystal, who shrinks away from it. Bertrell walks to the door and motions everyone out. Interior, first class section, Delta flight, night. Tom and Ray sit in the left aisle, Ray in the window seat. This is unbelievable. Like the Hilton. Flight attendant Jenny, twenties, attractive, puts a silver bowl of fresh fruit with powdered sugar on Tom's tray. Thanks. We'll be fine for a while. She smiles and leaves. Okay, so you're in Scotland. Right. Six weeks in a hospital. After what we've been through, felt like heaven. Ray puts down his drink, lowers his head, and folds his arms. You all right? I don't know. When do we land? An hour and a half or so. I never felt like this top side. Maybe it's the altitude? We'll take it easy for a while. No, no time. So they move me to Pearl, and I draw the USS Dorcellus. Five patrols, all good. And then we're in a three-sub wolf pack off the west coast of Australia, near Perth. Interior, bridge, Dorcellus submarine, afternoon. Periscope view, torpedoes miss the destroyer, trailing a convoy. The destroyer turns towards Dorcellus. The view shifts right, another destroyer angles at Dorcellus. The, the convoy is between us and our other two boats. We're alone. The destroyer's nailed you? Depth charges. Two hours of pure hell. Something stabbed me. Ray breaks off and turns towards the window, then faces front. We dropped like a stone. My god, it felt like nothing. Ray grips the seat arms, leans back and stares at the ceiling. He closes his eyes and then rubs his left cheek. Ray? Hey, buddy? Tom taps him on the shoulder lightly. Ray opens his eyes. How long before the, um, the ending? Oh, forever. An instant? I don't recall a sense of time. Blackness, ink, like we're drowning in it, and an emptiness, and then... Exterior, ocean bottom. In the dark waters, a lanternfish with blue lights along its side streaks by. Another one zips after it. Total blackness. Then, a faint orange hue appears from above. The hue becomes sparks that slowly intensify. The sparks coalesce into a descending outline of a man. The glowing man changes color to a shimmering, silvery hue. He flexes his knees as he lands on the ocean bottom, then steadies himself. The man looks around, bewildered. Other figures in the vicinity materialize in the same manner. Interior, first class section, delta flight, continuous. How does it occur? Every living thing has a unique electromagnetic signature. Well, something in Earth's magnetosphere regenerated ours. So, every ship sunk in the war? It only affects armored warships made of special type of steel. That plus deep ocean pressures upon it while sinking. Did you bear a grudge against the Japanese and have it out with them? We've never encountered any Japanese, neither. Even so, we cannot harm ourselves down there. We pass right through each other. Confused, Tom pokes Ray's solid arm with his finger. Hypernatremia. Hy Later, once the whole sunken shrew is down, there is the healing. Exterior, ocean bottom, continuous. A group of silvery men gathers at a flat area. They form themselves into several lines, shoulder to shoulder. Talking ceases. All is quiet. Gradually, orange sparks appear in front of them. The sparks coalesce to form a long, narrow keel of a ship. The orange luminescence changes color to blue-white. The shape-forming effect spreads upwards to form a submarine's hull, deck, deck gun, driving, diving sail, and bridge. The men break into cheers. One by one, they touch the shimmering blue-white submarine, swim up towards the deck, and haul themselves aboard. Interior, bridge, Brexville, night. Crystal, Bertrand, Grenache, and crew members watch a distant, lit-up city grow steadily larger. Recognize it? Home sweet home. What kind of a ship flies, Admiral? Admirals are pe pencil pushers, Miss Janelli. Good for shining seats. Behind them comes the sound of footsteps. Crystal turns. Derek approaches, flanked by two crew members. Hi. She rushes towards him and he gives her a huge hug. You okay, dude? Not hurt? I'm fine. But these pirates are afraid I'll hurt them. She shows her handcuffed wrists. Derek looks questioningly at Bertrell, then indicates Crystal. How come you're not handcuffed? Because he hasn't tried to escape. Behave and won't move, those. We're in separate cabins. 
Captain, put me in with Chris. I won't. Lovers and dangerous, Mr. Garnett, are very effective conspirators. Bertrell indicates her cuffs. A crew member unlocks them. Wichita, Kansas, off the port bow. They all turn and watch the Wichita skyline roll past. I want to know what's going on. Explain it to us, Captain, now. Bertrell ignores Derek, but gives Crystal a wicked smile. Interior, first class section, Delta flight, night. Two U-boat crews in the North Sea got credit for the discovery. German engineering. And quite by accident. A crewman named Lund. Series of shots. Sailor ghosts float through a church. Lund flashes blue-white, then solid, as he passes through a confessional door. Sailor ghosts float through the plate glass window of a bar. Lund's arm gets stuck and he yanks it. The window breaks. Patrons and staff look around, shocked, confused. Interior, first class section, Delta flight, continuous. So he is sent back with a doctor and they visit a medical clinic. When Lund solidifies, the doc talks him through drawing this blood sample. They discover he has hypoglycemia. Hypernatremia. High blood salt. It lets us become solid up here. Ray points under his left arm. Saline actuator. Dumps salt into the bloodstream, or removes it so we can evanesce. What's that? Disappear. How long does the actuator Ladies and gentlemen, on the left side of the aircraft, you can see Kansas City. We'll be over St. Louis in about 35 minutes, and we thank you for flying Delta. Ray turns and glances out at the distant glow of the city. Suddenly, he looks down, then behind. He half, he half rises from his seat to get a closer look to the window. A silvery bar of light far below recedes into the dark sky. Sir, can I help you, sir? Ray sits down and faces front. He looks at Jenny and shakes his head. She frowns and moves away. I think I might have seen her. Rexville? Not 100% sure. The speed seems right, though. How fast is she? Either ships do about 350 knots over land. About 400 miles per hour. Yep. Half that speed over water. I hope it was her. Because if they aren't going to St. Lou, then... I'll have failed to save Crystal. We. Oui. And we're not hosed. Not yet. When do you have to go back under? Ray indicates the sailing actuator under his arm. Good for about 175 hours. That's, uh, okay, let's see, a uh, 40-hour work week uh, multiplied up by seven days. I can't do math this time of night. We came up Sunday, but I won't last a week. I know that. Tom signals the flight attendant. Uh, can we still get coffee? I think so. May I take this? Sure, and thanks. She smiles approvingly at Tom, takes the tray, and leaves. Tom shakes his head, annoyed. Son of a bitch bastard was inside my house. They found his price. Yeah. Well, I say we get my niece and leave Derek with his new pals. The neither charter forbids involving topsiders in our affairs. It's a hell of a lot tougher rescuing two people. And aren't you violating this, this charter right now with me? I couldn't see any other way. You really want this rat bastard out of there, don't you? Sorry. We have to. Interior. Officer's cabin. Brexville night. Crystal sits on the bunk edge. She faces Brad, who leans on the desk across the cabin. Stan and Bilge, early 20s, burly sailors, stand by the door. You're my age, right? But you seem... You're just too smart. They didn't tell you? Crystal shakes her head no. I'm really older than I look. And we're not pirates. We come on... The old man said to button it. Crystal studies Stan's neck for a few seconds, sees a pair of moles, and then frowns. Think. She was kidnapped. Stan, what? You wouldn't have questions? You never could shut your yeah, Mac. Drove us dog crazy even then. Good thing the crows never got you. Squad on a dipshit. I should have made you your own Tokyo Rose. Stan and Bilge laugh. I know you. Stan, is it? That was you on the submarine when I was climbing out. Stan quickly looks away from her. What's this? Don't worry about it. A sneak preview. Just having a little fun. Fun! He says. You could have food barred the whole mission. So don't be. Attention, crew. In port at 0300. Short liberty for those not on watch. That is all. Interior, first class section, Delta flight, night. The jet lands and taxis down the runway. Ray looks out his window, scans the sky up and back. I hope we beat them here. Jenny hovers in the first class section and chats with some of the passengers. Then she comes over to them. Thank you, Tom and Ray. And please remember, the VIP lounge is open on the second concourse level. Very nice flight, Jenny. Thank Jenny's eyes widen as she looks at Ray. Her smile drops. 
Ray, very pale white, closes his eyes and folds his arms. He half disappears in his seat. A second later, he fully solidifies. Oh my god. My god. Are you- I'm fine. Sorry. Just a little tired. Jenny, shocked, backs away to the passengers behind them. Ray, you- I know, Tom. I know. Jesus, don't you get any warnings? A hiss in your ears. You get lightheaded. This came from nowhere. Tom grabs his backpack from under the seat ahead. Passengers disembark. Jenny and another flight attendant offer smiles and parting words. As Tom and Ray exit the jet, Jenny stares at Ray in shock. In interior, concourse, airport, continuous. Tom and Ray trot down the concourse to an escalator up. Can you locate her? She might blend in with regular air traffic. What's the length of a Delta jet? Beats me, a couple hundred feet? Brexville is 610 feet long. It'll be like spawning a bus on a bike with a bicycle path. Exterior, observation deck, airport, continuous. Tom and Ray exit an elevator, then cross to a railing. Ray scans the sky. Wish I'd had Binox. They own the boat? Yep. Which reminds me, here. Ray pulls keys from his pocket. She's Nakima. Slip 18. I got her for a week. I may have to cut out early, so... You'll get to finish this out. I hope. If not, take her for a few joy rides, then turn her in. Got you covered. Ray looks intensely at a moving light in the sky. It becomes a large jetliner, which lands several runways out. What's Captain Birchall's plan? Not sure what he wants to do with my... with Crystal. A shipmate told me a few things, but they got wise and left him under. We'll need to improvise. Yeah, that's a SEAL specialty. Think we'll take her off here? It is Bertrand's hometown, but St. Louis is a hub for American fleet weakers. A real party place, centrally located. You actually are in love with her. They watch a Boeing 777 take off. Ray's amazed. You do well by Crystal, under normal circumstances. Crystal doesn't look like you or her mother. She's so beautiful. Yeah, thanks, bud. Oh, damn, I didn't mean... <laughs> My sister and her ex adopted Crystal right after she was born. You married? Divorced. Happens a lot nowadays. Kids? Tom shakes his head no. I never got to fall in love. Once. Not me. Not all those other guys. Holy Christ, she's here! Tom scans the sky. Forget it, Tom. You're a topsider. You have to touch her to see her. The glowing USS Brexville banks into a slow turn, then gradually loses height. She's headed to her regular berth. You know where she's docking? Of course. Exterior woods adjacent to USS Brexville Pier, night. Ray and Tom crouch in the underbrush. The silvery USS Brexville sits anchored in the Mississippi, not far from the riverbank. A gangway angles down to a few feet above a wooden pier. Silvery figures walk down the gangway, jump down and randomly solidify as they continue down the pier. I wish I could see the Brexville. She's breathtaking. You'll see her soon enough. Electromagnetic propulsion. We need that. No more oil, nukes. What you need is neither steel. Anyone else coming? Uh-huh. Ready? And let's go! Tom and Ray scramble through the trees and undergrowth, then run across a bare area surrounding the pier. Exterior pier, Brexville, continuous. Tom drops and rolls smoothly underneath the pier. Ray tries it, but his shoulder bangs a pier post and he falls clumsily. He starts to crawl forward. A thump sound from the pier. Tom motions Ray to stay put. Exterior, pier, Brexville, continuous. Tom watches shoes materialize above. Let's shake a tail, time factor. Another thump, a second pair of shoes materialize. Ray folds his arms and disappears. The roses. You take them out. You gonna make it? I think so. A pair of shoes moves to the edge of the pier above Ray. Exterior, Pier, Brexville, Continuous. Any of you guys down there? Hello? We're trailing Grenache's shoes, finally turn and walk off. Their footsteps grow faint as they progress down the pier. Hey, Casper. Ray solidifies. Can't get over how you do that. Was that Captain Dickhead? The same. You figured out how to get us aboard? Either the anchor chain or gangway. Ray looks along the road opposite of the pier. They should have gone past us by now. Bridge watchers are posted aboard? Yeah, I guess. Well, we spotted on the gangway. Bertrell didn't go past yet. That's it. I'm off to follow them. No way, Ray. We do not split up. I have to know where they're going. It might be the key. You go aboard and secure Crystal and Derek. 
Okay, there is this. Much easier for one man to get aboard on scene. Ray nods, then prepares to dash out from underneath the pier. You know where to hold up, so just wait for me. I won't be long. Casper! Yeah? Eliminations. What's that? Why I left the seals after eight years. I had a big issue with up close and personal eliminations. Ray drags a finger across his throat in a questioning look. Uh-huh. No stomach for it. And that, my friend, endangers the whole team. Okay, good luck. And you. See you aboard. Ray scrambles across the open area and fades into the woods. Exterior, pier, Rexville, night. Tom stands, then raises his arms and feels for the gangway. His hands brush against an invisible structure. He jumps and grabs a cross rod on the gangway's underside. The gangway and the entire USS Breckville appear. Tom hooks his ankles along the gangway edges and climbs up. Exterior, residential street, night. Ray shadows Bertrell and Grenache as they near the top of the street. Grenache has his arm around Bertrell's shoulder. They both turn out of sight into a cemetery at the corner. Ray reaches the cemetery gate and looks through. He folds his arms and becomes silvery, then climbs the gate. Exterior, cemetery, continuous. Ray hears a muffled shout. He moves behind a huge monument. Bertrell and Grenache stand a dozen yards away. Bertrell stifles a sob. Grenache has his arm around him. She's one in a million. An artist. Did you know? People walk. Walking by was always stopped to admire her lawn. Small trees she planted to each set in colored stones. Stained glass. Canterbury Cathedral. Love stained glass. The world lost. No finer lady anywhere, pal. None. Bertrell bends to a knee. He places a bouquet of roses on the ground, then lowers his head. He eventually straightens up, and they walk away slowly. Ray waits until they climb the gate, then walks to where they stood. He moves the bouquet. The gravestone reads, Melissa Marie Bertrell, born August 30th, 1917, died December 14th, 1942. Ray repositions the bouquet. As he stands, he grimaces sharply. He runs in a crouch towards the cemetery gate and grabs his stomach with both hands, then falls to his knees. He flickers between solid and silvery form. Ray presses the actuator under his left arm, but remains visible. Ray goes over to the gate, then falls down to the other side. He rolls onto his stomach, struggles to his feet, then half runs down the road towards the highway. Exterior, highway, adjacent to woods, continuous. Ray crawls across two northbound lanes. Headlights flash. A car roars around the southbound curve. Its lights beam up Ray's face. The car swerves wide, but its front tire clips Ray's heel. He spins and rolls. The impact jolts him, and he rises, then limps across the highway and onto the shoulder. Brake lights flash to his left. The car door opens. A middle-aged woman jumps out and runs towards him. Oh my god, mister. Are you hurt? Are you okay? Oh, please, God. I'm so sorry. I didn't see you. Oh, no. Ray finds a faint trail leading from the road shoulder to the woods and weaves his way down it. Exterior, trail through woods, continuous. The woman draws nearer, but Ray quickens his pace. He trips and falls, struggles to get up. A sound of flowing water spurs Ray on. The woman is nearly upon him. I want to help. I can call 911. Are you hurt? Please, sir, my God. Ray crawls, then drops down a slight incline towards the river bank. He slides out of control, faster and faster. Ray goes over the edge of the river bank and tumbles through the air. Then he hits the river with a loud splash. The woman eases down close to the water. She watches a flickering body move downriver, sink, then fade to nothing. Exterior, gangway, Brexville, night. Tom reaches the hull and boosts himself over the port rail, then scrambles under the gangway platform. He pulls a rock from his pack and flips it off the ship. Two seconds after the splash, footsteps pound down a ladder from the superstructure area. Tom crawls out and streaks across the deck to a gun turret. Exterior, forward number two turret, Rexville continuous. As footsteps approach, Tom ducks beneath the gun house and flattens himself against the barbette vertical shaft. You think Shirk fell overboard? That would make a tsunami. Go for it. I'll check out. Give a shout if you see anything. Tom grasps a steel beam within the gun house innards above. He boosts his legs up, wraps them around a bundle of cables. A pair of shoes stops near the turret. Tom's arms shake. His legs begin to lose their grip. The shoes point forward and move off. Tom drops down and presses against the barbette. Anything? Both sailors approach. Tom boosts his legs up again. Zip. Let's get out. Footsteps fade, then change cadence as they ascend a ladder. 
Tom jumps down. He locates the gun house's rear port hatch. He gives himself a silent count, then straightens, pushes up the dogging handle, opens the hatch, and steps inside. The hatch shuts, and the dogging handle locks down. Interior, bridge, Brexville, early morning. Bertrell, Grenache, Derek, and Crystal stand on the bridge with other sailors. Four men each surround Derek and Crystal. Captain, all crews aboard and at their stations. Bertrell nods, then presses the bridge microphone talk button. All hands, this is your captain. I trust you took advantage of the few hours ashore. It was too brief a layover, but we'll return after the mission is complete. Prepare to leave port. That is all. Navigator, you may get underway. Exterior, Pier, Brexville, continuous. USS Brexville slowly rises out of the water. Her keel breaks the surface, rivulets of water drip from the hull. She turns, slowly, majestically. Interior, bridge, Brexville, continuous. The ship faces east. The sun shines orange off the water. Who the wicked, Captain? Proceed. Brexville turns to port, angles up, and moves forward. The heavy cruiser swings around in a giant half-circle. Height, 150 feet. Now watch our crack navigator strut his stuff, folks. A barge moves up the Mississippi River ahead. Brexville streaks forward. Her speed rapidly increases. The ship bears down on the gateway arch and then arrows through it, dead center. Everyone turns aft. The arch recedes rapidly behind them. Good shooting, Lieutenant. Grenache nods. He manipulates the keel propulsor controls with his right hand and the wheel with his left. Turning. Course 065. The ship angles down slightly to the left. Exterior, main deck, Rexville, morning. The portside hatch of number two forward turret opens slowly. Tom steps out, shuts the hatch, and jumps down. He picks his way along the deck towards the superstructure. Tom gets to the starboard hatch, opens it, and slips inside. Interior, void space, Rexville, continuous. Tom switches on his pen light. The void bristles with wires, switch boxes, pipes, and cables. The pen light illuminates a circular hatch above. Tom puts the light in his mouth and climbs the narrow steel ladder. At the hatch, Tom turns the dogging wheel. He listens after a few turns, then rotates the wheel until it stops. He ascends one step and uses his head to open the hatch. Three stanchions border the hatch. Steel safety chains looped one stanchion to the other. Interior, officers count country passageway, Brexville continuous. Tom climbs from the open hatch. He pivots to lower it. Footsteps and voices approach. Tom freezes. He sits, then swivels his legs onto the ladder. He climbs down a few rungs and lowers the hatch just barely enough to look out. Far down the corridor, some people emerge from a side passageway, turn, and walk toward him. Tom bends down, and the hatch closes. Interior, void space, Brexville continuous. Footsteps slow, then stop. Tom eases up the hatch a few inches with his head. He watches Crystal and Derek go through a door. Two men position themselves on either side of the door. Interior, Captain's stateroom, Brexville, morning. Derek and Crystal sit in front of Captain Bertrell's desk. Crystal notices a photograph behind him. You a baseball fan, Miss Janelli? She glares at Bertrell. The late Stan Musial, Navy man. How thrilling, you bastard. He played on the ship's official team, the St. Louis Cardinals. I like the Royals. Did you hear about the Show Me series in 1985? What is this, a boy's sweaty locker room? Why did you kidnap us, Admiral? Not kidnapped. Honored guests. Chris, let him get this over with. Why don't you knock him into next Thursday? Uncle Tom would, but... Enough, kids. Pay close attention. Bertrand walks to a blackboard and picks up a pointer. On the board is chalked the east coast of Canada and the USA, the Atlantic Ocean, Germany, France, and British Isles. You asked why you're here. Ready for a little history lesson? Fuck off. Bertrell lowers the pointer, Crystal stands. Admiral, Professor, whatever you are, I'm not your pupil. I'm a prisoner. Take me to my cell. Bertrell puts down the pointer and walks over to face Crystal. He nods at two sailors nearby and they grab her upper arms. We can return you to your cabin and chain you high on the bunk post. Standing up with a gag in your sewer mouth. Would that suit you? Chris, maybe we should... Crystal eyeballs Bertrell. She gives him the finger. Does this suit you, dickhead? She sits. Derek touches her arm. She pushes his hand away. Bertrell, a tiny smile on his face, returns to the blackboard. You're aboard a heavy cruiser, Cleveland class, launched 1942. 1942? What? We're dead sunk. Or we thought so until we discovered that some World War II ships and their crews somehow get regenerated. You're a fucking ghost? We are neither's. 
We don't know exactly how this happened, and most of us don't give a hoot in hell. Bertrell points to an area on the east coast of Canada. Halifax, Nova Scotia, just before America entered the war on... He aims the pointer at Derek. September something, 1941, I think. He points at Crystal. Why would I care? In the past. Meaningless, right? Now, before America's entry into the war, Britain was supplied by convoys that left from here. He taps the pointer at the point east of Halifax. Germany sprung their U-boat wolf packs here. Nothing could stop. Rexville drops, then rolls up on the starboard side. Bertrell stumbles, but remains on his feet. Sailors crouch, Derek and Crystal nearly fall out of their chairs. The ship levels itself quickly. Bertrell moves to his desk. Sorry, Captain. A small jet was angling in a mess in 10 o'clock. It's daylight, Nash. Are you aware? Yes, sir. Bridge lookouts have been doubled. They have, sir. This jet was lost in some tricky background. I don't want to hear it, Navigator. Nothing is going to snap through this mission. Do you understand? He clicks off the intercom and returns to the blackboard. Wouldn't they fly right through us? We're as solid as stone. Where were we? After Pearl Harbor, Queen Georgina gets converted for troop transport. You mean what we're staying on? Yes. Didn't you take the tour? We'll do it when we get back. I recommend it. Queen Georgina was packed to the gills with GIs, then zigzagged across the ocean at the top speed. U-boats couldn't catch her. Bertrell points to an area on the board north of Ireland. The Bloody Foreland. She picked up an escort here mostly because of German planes on patrol. Bertrell puts down the pointer. Our current destination. The scene of the crime, lady and gentlemen, with both of you to bear witness. Exterior, ocean, night. Icebergs bob in the black waters of the North Atlantic. Up and back, a point of light grows quickly in size. USS Brexville, glowing, flashes past and forward. Interior, officer's cabin, Brexville, night. Crystal, alone, gets up from the bunk and opens her door. Two sailors sit across the passageway facing her. Bathroom? One of the sailors gestures down the passageway. Interior, officer's ca country passageway, Brexville, continuous. Crystal walks down the dark passageway and opens the bathroom door. She sees a silhouette in the mirror. It's a shadowed man reflected in the connecting passageway behind. He stands flat against the wall. The man raises a finger to his lips. Then he points. Crystal goes inside. Interior, officer's head. Brexville, continuous. The man streaks across the passageway and into the bathroom. He closes the door and turns on the light. No ghost, Tiger. Genuine article. Uncle T, what are you doing here? Keep it down. No time. A man who loves you very much got me aboard. It couldn't be Derek. A man named Ray Kelvin. Derek strolled in with her... You know? Kind of. He's been weird ever since he conned me into his trip. I'll get you both off here when the ship stops. Okay, gotta run. Not yet. Sorry, Tiger. Now listen, don't tell Derek I'm here or that you know about it, right? She nods. When I hit the lights, you crack open the door. If it's clear, give me a thumbs up. No sound. Go. Tom kisses her cheek and Crystal gives him a quick hug. He turns off the light. Crystal barely opens the door and looks down the passageway. One sailor stares ahead of, at her cabin door. The other has his head back against the wall, eyes closed. She signals. Tom glides across the passageway and vanishes. Interior, wardroom, Rexville, early morning. Derek and Crystal sit at a table across from each other. A sailor pours them coffee. Four other sailors stand nearby. You look so tired, Chris. Gee, thanks. So do you. Couldn't sleep. Too keyed up. The hum from the ship drops slightly. I think we're slowing down. The captain said we're almost here. Nice of him to keep one of us informed, right, hun? I just wish it was all finished. This is such bullshit. It's all been bullshit. Yeah, it sure has been. The door opens. Bertrell comes in and sits at the table. How was breakfast? When are we docking? Bertrell ignores Derek and looks directly at Crystal. Very soon. You shall see things no top sire has ever laid eyes upon. Consider a crossing of a frontier between our peoples. Bertrell gets up, goes to the wardroom door, and opens it. Tom stands there, wrists cuffed and in front and ankles chained. His left eye is bruised. Three sailors surround him. We discovered this heroic fighting man in our number two turret. Bertrell gestures to all of them to come in, then closes the door. Uncle Tom? They kidnap you too? We're three in sickbay, thanks to him. No worries. We heal quickly underneath. Petty Officer Gilmore, have a seat with your family. The sailors prod Tom forward to a chair next to Derek. Crystal focuses on his bruised face. What did these cowards do to you? I'll live. I thought to hold you in the brig, but I think you'll enjoy their show. Bertrell goes to the wardroom door and speaks low to Chief Petty Officer Funet Fuentes, 30s in the passageway. 
Betrell walks off. The chief comes in and closes the door. How did that happen? Someone's elbow. It's nothing. Crystal gestures at Derek with a questioning look. No reason to hold back now. Crystal nods, then moves to sit directly across from Derek. You're a stinking rat. Derek tries to look shocked. I know everything. You did all this, you fucking liar bastard. I didn't. They're the ones who lied to me. Con man. You conned me and my family, the only man I've ever trusted in my whole life. And you got him too. I did what I did for you, babe. For what? Money? And quit calling me babe. Don't you ever call me that again, you motherfucker. You're the woman I want to spend the rest of my life with. Crystal yanks off her engagement ring and flings it at Derek. It hits him in the chest, bounces onto the floor. Derek gets up and storms off towards a porthole. The hum from USS Breckville stops. What can we do? Sit tight, Tiger. We'll be Jake. Chief? Time? Yes, sir. Chief Fuentes directs the other sailors to escort Tom, Crystal, and Derek. They all leave the wardroom. Exterior, main deck. Rexville, morning. USS Brexville hovers 50 feet above the North Atlantic. The weather is overcast with choppy, wind-whipped waves. Bertrell, Tom, Crystal, and Derek stand outside the bridge, starboard side. Ten sailors flank them. The rest of the crew lines the starboard rail on deck. Bertrell holds a bullhorn. He faces the three captives. We project images to each other as a way to communicate underneath. We're going to share some with you. Are they holograms? They're a replay of electromagnetic. Patterns, sight, and sound is what our texts tell us. Captain Bertrell, wait. All of you need to be educated, especially you. Bertrell lasers it on Crystal. Captain, what is it, Petty Officer of Gilmore? You can't force this on us. That is not and never will be our intent. First, would anyone like to go to their cabins? Crystal? I can take it if you can. Quite the spirit lady you have here, Mr. Garnett. Crystal moves away from Derek and closer to Tom. <clears throat> If a viewing gets too much, simply shut your eyes. I'll start. Bertrell faces the water and closes his eyes. He raises his hands, drops them behind his neck, and massages the base of his skull. The current scene fades. Exterior, ocean, afternoon. The sun sparkles upon a blue ocean. Look to the left, the gray ghost. A gray-painted Queen Georgina churns through rolling swells. The silhouette of a bomber flies over the ship. B-17 flying fortress. The Queen is about to lose air cover. An engine groan sounds as the B-17 banks and heads away. It's now up to us to end six other ships to shield her into Scotland. Bertrell drops his hands, leans on the bridge rail a moment. It was a harebrained operation. The Queen steamed faster than her escorts, and she couldn't slow down. Petty Officer Cordray? The sailor Cordray puts his hands up to the back of his head. Exterior, ocean, afternoon. The port side of the Queen Georgina appears very close. Tiny figures line all of her visible decks. Fifteen thousand troops aboard. Since she's zigzagging, you see her now off our starboard flank. Thank you, Mr. Cordray. Chief Saladin? Queen Georgina's starboard side is close, slightly behind. He's looking off our port side, as was nearly everyone topside. Voices sound on board the 1942 USS Brexville. Hey, Bulldog! What's she... Christ almighty, what in the hell is she doing? Holy shit! They see it. The dog faces. They see it. Queen Georgina draws nearly even with Brexville. Gradually, her bow angles in on the cruiser. Oh my god! Get back! Get back! Get to port! The entire scene goes black. Derek gasps in horror. Crystal screams and falls back into the two sailors. Exterior, main deck, Brexville, morning. Is everyone okay? Would you rather go below now, Miss Janelli? She shakes her head no. Very good. Seaman skates? Exterior, ocean, afternoon. A rolling swell makes the ocean appear to drop down. Queen Georgina churns through the wreckage and flotsam. The Queen slowed down after the collision, but didn't stop. A rolled-up object floats a dozen feet away. Petty Officer Gilmore, what's that? Casting it. Right. A life raft that can carry fifty men, but that day they couldn't be unrolled. How come? Oil. The lashings were covered with oil. No grip. The focus shifts right. The stern section of USS Brexville explodes and sinks. Many of us who perished immediately when it hit the stern. Thick black smoke billows up from the burning oil on the surface. When the Queen's stem rammed us, I was killed instantly. Nearly everyone on the bridge died as a result of that impact. The focus goes left. Brexville's bow section floats level. Almost everyone in the bow section survived, except for those who eventually gave up and drowned. Exterior, main deck, Brexville, morning. My men waited two hours for the British destroyers to double back and rescue them. Chief Karaka? Exterior, ocean, afternoon. 
Men cling to wreckage to rolled up castanets or hold on to each other and, fo and float in groups. Crystal gasps as a man near our castanet stares at the viewer. Another man by himself struggles to stay afloat in the swells. His head ducks underneath. Globs of oil bob on the surface. One closes in on the man. He moves his arms weakly and tries to swim away from it. The glob of oil floats onto his face. The scene shifts skyward as a swell passes under. When the surface becomes visible again, the man is gone. Exterior, main deck, Rexville, morning. 338 men, murdered by the recklessness of Queen Georgina's skipper. One man did this. One. You take no responsibility at all? What was that, petty officer? His ship was crammed with American GIs. Couldn't you have avoided? No avoiding was necessary. Betrell whirls to face Tom and takes a step towards him. Tom moves into combat stance despite the handcuffs and ankle chains. Sailors grab his arms. Bertrell gets right in his face. You never zigzag overtaking another vessel. Yet, yet that rule wasn't even reviewed by the Board of Inquiry. When Fleet Week became possible, my men and I uncovered their lies. He backs up to the rail. Obstruction of a capital ship during wartime maneuvers was put into my official record. That's why I died. And you? Bertrell stabs his finger at Crystal. You're going to set everything right. You will cleanse my record. Me? Fuck that noise, Admiral. Stick that record up your ass. Bertrell's face changes to pure rage. He advances on her. She shrinks back. How dare you? You have no honor, foul-mouthed wench. You should be- Sir! Captain Bertrell. Why her? Bertrell slowly calms down. She's the living link to the outlaw skipper of the Queen Georgina, a rogue named Randolph W. Hedges C. I'm adopted, Admiral. We spent month after month tracing her, his lineage. You, Miss Ginelli, would have a different name had your parents kept you. Your head to see his great granddaughter. So it's her fault, and not a bit of it yours. Fucking insane, sir. Petty Officer Gilmore, would you like to be cast into the bloody foreland in front of your niece? All right. I'll use my military connections to get this reopened. The chain of command between Hedgesi and you is non-existent. You are not of her true family. Uncle Tom's the closest. Shut your stench of a mouth. She is family, Captain. Like the bond between a ship and her crew. Patrell turns and goes to the rail. He raises the bullhorn. Attention all hands. Secure from stations. Ship will get underway in 30 minutes. That is all. The men along the rail slowly drift from it. Some form small groups and hug. Others move towards hatches and ladders. Very well, Petty Officer Gilmore. Then I will hold you as responsible as her to set things right again. For myself and for my men. Bertrell walks towards a ladder leading down from the bridge. Where are we going now, Captain? We're getting a magic carpet ride to Wichita, Kansas. Then I and my crew go back underneath. Exterior, main deck, Rexville, late afternoon. Tom, Crystal, and Derek stand along the starboard rail and watch the panorama street by. Crystal turns to Derek. I want to talk to my uncle alone. Derek looks down and moves away towards the stern. Crystal takes Tom's arm and they walk towards the bow. What's he like, Uncle Tom? The man who helped you. Tom focuses on a submarine-like sail close to the cruiser's bow. Minor movements occur in the diving planes. Ray's a good man. A real shipmate. I think I saw him back there. The viewing? Yeah, but other places too. He watched over you in Wichita. Did you ever see him in your house? Crystal shakes her head. He said he was in your house, looking through things. That's how he knew where to find me in her most speech. He... I know, Cowtown back home. After working in the gift shop, I'd go sometimes to our Old West Saloon. Interior, Old West Saloon, Wichita, Kansas, night. Crystal, dressed in traditional Old West clothes, sits at a large table with other men and women dressed similarly. At the bar, a man in a cowboy hat drinks a beer. He turns on his bar stool and looks at Crystal's table a long moment. Exterior, main deck, Rexville, continuous. He was there a few nights in a row, but he never introduced himself. In that case, how would you like to go to St. Louis with me tonight? To meet this guy, Ray? He said if it neither dies out of the water, it's all over. I want to go back there, see that he's okay. An object glances off Brexville's hull. A bird. Poor thing. They continue walking towards the bow. Anyway, yes, I'm going with you. I owe Ray that much. I want to go too. In front of the ship's diving sail stand, four guards. Tom and Crystal turn towards the stern. Derek approaches them. What? I'm going with you to St. Louis. This was all my fault. Uncle Tom? I don't know. We're supposed to trust you now, right? Look, I already have some treasures, but I don't want any of it. I'll give it all away. I'll hold you to that. You won't need to, Tom. 
Crystal walks to Derek. Up close, he starts to turn away. Look at me. You can come. But try anything and I won't need my uncle to avenge it. And forget about our marriage. I don't marry con men. Exterior sky, Wichita, Kansas, early evening. Rexville moves above the city across the Arkansas River. She floats over a bridge. She descends, then turns towards a pier just past the bridge. Rexville moves close to the pier and hovers above it. Exterior, main deck, Rexville, continuous. Tom, Crystal, and Derek stand near the gangway platform. They may try and get cute. Jump to the pier, then move up quickly. We stay together no matter what. Exterior, pier, Arkansas River, continuous. A family, father, mother, two small boys, one small girl, with a dog, walk slowly around the perimeter of the pier. The dog bolts down the pier back towards the riverbank. The girl runs after it. The rest of the family begins to follow them. One of the boys turns around, picks up a rock, and throws it towards the river. Exterior, main deck, Brexville, continuous. Crystal steps back. A click sound below as the rock hits. The boy looks directly through them. Then he turns, runs down the pier, and looks over his shoulder several times. Rotrell approaches. Three sailors with sea bags follow him. And your belongings? The bags are mementos of our excursions. The sailors hand a sea bag to each of them, then withdraw. I understand that we'll be watching your every move. I expect a complete reprieve, Miss Janelli, Petty Officer Gilmore. Patrol, pray we don't tell everyone about you and you're sick. They won't believe. And even if, we'll know. Then they'll know us. Patrol turns to the bridge, raises his arms, then lowers it. He leaves them and makes his way to the bridge ladder. Rexville drops and extends its gangway above the pier. Tom, Crystal, and Derek hesitate. A sailor gestures for them to go quickly. Crystal steps onto the gangway, followed by Derek, then Tom. Exterior, pier, Arkansas River, continuous. Crystal and Derek both jump off the gangway to the pier. Tom turns. Captain Betrell salutes. Tom salutes back. He jumps off the gangway and looks behind him at the opposite riverbank. USS Brexville has vanished. Exterior, driveway, Derek's house, evening. The threesome walks up the driveway to Derek's car. I'll go in and set up the charter flight while you guys are gone. I want you in the car with me. You got your phone? Derek nods as he slides into the driver's side. Tom goes for the back seat. That's okay. I'll sit back there. Tom shrugs and gets into the passenger seat. A dejected Derek looks in the rearview mirror at Crystal. She turns away from him as he starts the car moving. Exterior, driveway, Crystal's house, continuous. Tom jumps out of the car first and assists Crystal out. Mom's SUV is here, but I don't think she's home. We'll be back in about an hour. Okay. When do we take off? Nine o'clock, or whenever we get there. They'll wait. It's only an hour to St. Louis. She gives Tom a quick hug and starts away. Derek leans far over towards the passenger side window. Bye, Chris. Crystal pauses for a second. She then continues up the walkway to her door, opens it, and steps inside. She switches on the hall light, then waves through the screen door as Derek backs the car out of her driveway. Interior, hallway, Crystal's house, continuous. Crystal drops the sea bag and walks to the stairs. Mom, it's me. No answer. Crystal heads towards the kitchen. A low thump sounds. Crystal stops, turns, and goes back to the stairs. She climbs up a few of them. Mom, you in? Crystal walks back towards the kitchen. On her left, she sees the patio door slide open by itself. Hey, what? Crystal stumbles backwards. She struggles, then is caught by unseen arms that soon pin her to the floor. She tries to yell, but her voice is muffled. Her, her sleeve moves up. A cotton ball rubs itself on her upper arm. A syringe floats over and plunges into her arm. She twinges, then relaxes and lies perfectly still. Her sea bag opens itself and upends. The contents fall out. The sea bag pulls over Crystal, feet first, then encloses her whole body. The top buckle shuts, snaps itself shut. The sea bag floats out to the patio door. When it reaches the lawn, the sea bag drops to the grass and slides away from the house. Exterior, driveway, Derek's house, evening. Derek leans against the car hood and fiddles with his phone. Tom rushes out the door, shuts it, then runs to Derek's car. What are you doing with that? No rush, Tom. We're good on time. Tom wraps on the hood of the car. Let's get underway. Interior, Derek's car, Wichita, Kansas, continuous. Did that jackal ever tell you anything more about this scheme? I didn't even know about going to the sinking. The professor said we'd go on Brexville, and then Bertrand would take us to Wichita. Is your number in this thing? Tom grabs Derek's phone and holds it out. Derek presses a few buttons on it. Four rings sound from the speaker. Hi, it's Crystal, and I'm not. Tom breaks the connection. Probably in the shower. We'll be there in a few minutes. I know. Something doesn't jive. What does Bertrell have from us? Um, the Navy records to fix them. 
No, and that is all. Just our promise to reopen an inquiry into this case. Tom clicks the redial button. Crystal's recording starts and Tom clicks it off. Yeah, and if we don't, he threatened to... It seems too thin. Something else. Until they got me, it was easy peasy hiding on that ship. My SEAL training, I figured at first. You're saying maybe they knew all along you were aboard? Tom shrugs. Derek points ahead to the Arkansas River. That's where I proposed to her. On a cruise ship during Riverfest. Was the marriage his idea too? No. Just to get her to Long Beach. The Trump had this figured down to the wire. The timing, your visit with Professor at UCLB. Yeah, he told me about the yacht and gave me some more treasure. But why would he? Why? Like a down payment? I had to show him our rental so he could easily find it and turn it in. I guess Bertrand didn't want cops. Forget that for now. Why stage this whole thing in Long Beach? Tom hits the redial again. Still no answer. That's where I graduated college. Who cares where you went to school? No, it's... Oh shit. It's the river. See? That's the answer. Derek is clueless. Tom points out the window. That son of a bitching river. But I said the marriage was our... I ought to be sent back to middle school. What did he just do? Bertrell? Who the fuck else? He just dropped us off an open pier during rush hour, like he was delivering mail. Yeah, but... Have you and Crystal ever gone to that pier? Of course, it's near my house. Bingo. If Bertrell wanted to take her on a joyride to lay on the gilts about this sinking, then grab her here. Why go across... Tom hits redial again, but disconnects after two rings. That ghost bastard just fucked us. What are you talking about? They've got her. What? You're crazy. Listen. Patrell couldn't be sure of everything, of everyone's loyalty, including yours. He didn't count on me, but probably factored in that someone from the outside might interfere. Yeah. I mean, now I want to help. Patrell had to purge his ship of anyone who could possibly stop him. From doing what? Exterior, driveway, Crystal's house, continuous. Tom jumps out of the car and runs to the door. The hall light's off. He opens the screen, ties the knob, then beats on the door. Tiger! The key. Give me your goddamn key. Derek trots up and hands it to him. Tom jams the key home and swings the door open. They both enter. Total silence. Tom discovers the open patio door and steps through it. Check all the rooms. Double quick. Exterior. Backyard. Crystal's house. Continuous. Tom moves laterally in a crouch and examines the grass. He looks up and focuses on a narrow lake that runs behind other houses on Crystal Street. He sees wet footprints on the lawn and runs a hand over them. Derek steps out of the patio door and, join, and joins Tom. Nobody here. Patrell hovered above the lake and dropped a raiding party into it. He gestures down at the wet grass, the faint tracks in it. They've got her all right. Come on. Tom stands and they both head for the front door of the house. You think she's in St. Louis? No way. What's in Long Beach? My college. Fuck the college and think. Where are you guys staying? The, um, Queen Georgina. Interior, Captain Stateroom, Rexville, evening. Crystal sits in front of Bertrell's desk, cuffed to her chair. Four sailors stand nearby. Bertrell comes in. We'll be fine. Go. The sailors leave and Bertrell closes the door. Where's Brad? Mr. McKitterick and a few others left willingly before the viewing. Too human for you, right? By the way, I know that you're him. Who am I, love? That you were the guy who cleaned our windshield at the college. Keen eye. Yes. If I asked your turncoat fiancé for money, that means that meant things at, at the college were set up. Do I get an Oscar? Why did you... Why did we have to see that pervert Toronto? Your Judas boyfriend never trusted me, but he worships his professor. So I had him deliver the change of plans above, about the yacht and the 30 pieces of silver. Patrell removes a wallet photo and shows it to Crystal. She frowns and examines it closely. The intercom clicks. You see just what I see. My little Melissa I looks so much like you. What is it? Phoenix off the port bow, sir. On schedule, 90 minutes. Splendid. Let me know when we're close to the Sultan Sea. Bertrand clicks off, walks to the porthole, and looks out. That inland sea will slow us up. We only go half as fast over water. Goddess, Melissa. A last minute addition, your love boat. She was abandoned in the Gulf of California. He returns to his seat behind the desk. My dear wife passed away two months after me. When she heard U-boat sunk us, that the captain went down with the ship, she acted. U-boat? But didn't the queen... They held it back. Bad for morale. Buff. My Melissa, delicate soul. So fragile. So dependent on me. Is she... a neither now too? 
He holds out his hand to Crystal for the photograph. Batrell takes it out, caresses the edges. She died in the water. She sliced her wrists in our bathtub. Oh, God. They buried my Melissa with her unborn son still inside her. Interior, passenger cabin. Cassenta Silkwing, night. Are we landing at LAX? Long Beach. We get to the marina to raise boat. Then we improvise. You think Bertrell might kill her? What do you think? I'd have to kill him myself, then. That's a hell of a turnaround. Okay, I need to know everything you know about Bertrell. Did this all start with your engineering professor? Yeah, Tom. I'm an asshole. Chris is right. She always is. I don't want to go into it now. Let's just help her. Tom turns in his seat and grabs Derek's upper arm. Do you really want to help her? A SEAL team fends out everything it can about a target before striking. Are you clear on the target? Well, yeah. We catch Bertrell and get Chris away, I guess. Right? Tom leans in close to Derek and speaks just above a whisper. Does Crystal talk of her childhood? Um, not much. Hardly ever. There's a reason. Ready? She had an abortion when she was 12. What? She had a what? Keep it down. The co-pilot turns to look at them, then faces front. My sister woke with a bad cough late one night, and her husband wasn't in bed. Guess where he was? No. You don't mean... Crystal missed the seventh grade. Hospitals, emotional trauma, therapy, meds, you name it. That bastard stole a year of her life and more. Now she's being held. Derek starts to turn towards the window. Tom grabs him. Listen to me. Your fiancé, my niece, is being held by a madman for God knows what purpose. What are you going to do about it? We... we have to stop him. We might have to splash the whole fucking lot. Eliminations. Got that? If you can't handle it, then I don't want you on my team. Derek turns to the window. Tears fill his eyes. Look, partner. I'm beat. We're going into action in a few hours. We should both get some shots. Tom gets up and speaks to the co-pilot, female, 30s. As he returns to his seat, the cabin lights dim. Interior, stateroom, Rexville, night. Transwater stabilized. Stand by for speed reduction. Crystal deliberately looks up at the Stan Musial photograph. Stan the man, 1942 series. Games one and two split. They sunk us on the, the off day. An American crew later told us the cards won it all. Stand by for TWS. Now? The ship drops slightly and angles down. The hum decreases. We lived in Cairo, Illinois. Really? Did you like it there? I don't remember much. We moved to Wichita when I was four. After the meeting, we'll revisit some Mississippi River haunts. Meeting? To dispense with some business. Oh. Okay, if I powder my nose? Bertrell opens the door and motions two men to come in. Escort her to the officer's head. They uncuff her and head down the passageway. Halfway down, Crystal suddenly crouches, grabs the left leg of the sailor on her right and pushes up. He falls diagonally in front of the other sailor, who also stumbles and falls. Crystal hurls over them, then runs at the open deck hatch. She slides under the stanchion chain, gets her feet onto a rung, and climbs down. The two sailors scramble to their feet. One turns back towards the pair of sailors near the captain's stateroom. Call the bridge. Interior, void space, Brexville, continuous. Crystal climbs down the metal ladder awkwardly. She looks up. A sailor, several rungs above her, descends rapidly. She reaches the deck, turns, and grabs the hatch handle. She pushes it up and steps out just as the sailor jumps down. Exterior, starboard hatch, Brexville, continuous. On deck, Crystal turns and slams the hatch. The sailor's arm catches between the hatch and the opening. He bellows in pain. She runs to the rail. A sailor comes at her from the right, two more from the left. She gets a leg over and brings up the other, but they grab at her and then pull her back over the rail. They carry her to the bridge ladder, then up. Crystal looks back and sees the moonbeam disappear off of the Salton Sea. Rexville angles up and increases speed. Interior, passenger cabin, Cassenta Silkwing, night. The co-pilot touches Tom's shoulder. He stirs and brings his reclined seat upright. Derek wakes up and does the same. We'll be landing soon, but we must divert to LAX. Long Beach has fog. Oh, Christ. Look, we can't be late for our appointment on the ground. Have you reserved a rental car? Tom nods. We'll transfer that to LAX and bring it to the tarmac. Appreciate it. When do we land? 9.55. Thanks again. She leaves. Tom grabs a pad and pen and writes figures. Rexville gets to Long Beach between 10 and 10.30. Great. We get there before them. True. But we have to switch vehicles. They can park Brexville anywhere. Interior bridge, Brexville, night. One way or another, he'll stop you. 
you'll shower. Reviews in my men provide a GI shower. Then you'll change into the clothes and items already laid out. Make a fuss and they'll be more than happy to assist. I'm sure of that. Are you done? Go. The meeting approaches. Rachel nods at the sailors, who take her towards the ladder. Interior, rental car, 710 Freeway, South, night. Tom races in the left lane. The speedometer shows 85. A sign reads, 710 Freeway ends half mile. Why don't we call the Coast Guard? A good one. Be on the lookout for an invisible flying warship. Tom cuts off a car as he swerves into the right lane. You're not in the Grand Prix. You ever see it here? Yeah, it was exactly like this. Tom veers onto Shoreline Village Drive. Ahead and in the distance, we see Queen Georgina all lit up. Tom drives to a parking gate. He leans over to his left. Get the wallet out of my pocket. Derek pulls the wallet, opens it, extracts a 20. He hands it to Tom. Eight dollars after nine o'clock. Right, whatever. Keep the change. Tom hands him the bill, then nudges the car forward. He starts through as the gate rises. It scrapes the rooftop. Tom turns into the parking lot, crosses it, and accesses the, the berm roadway. He swerves into a parking spot and stops. Exterior, berm parking area, Long Beach Marina, continuous. Tom and Derek run down the pier and jump to Nakima's deck. Can you pilot a boat? Derek nods. Tom tosses him the keys. I'll keep lookout from up here. Where to? The waterway in front of the Queen. Interior, Captain's stateroom, Brexville, night. Four sailors avert their eyes as Crystal slips into a short white satin dress. She steps into matching satin heels. Gold and ruby jewelry lie on the captain's desktop. Crystal walks to it, then puts on the arm bracelet, ankle bracelet, with a necklace with a single large ruby. The hum of the keel propulsor ceases, and the ship stops. Crystal reacts to the quiet, then rests the tiara in her hair. I feel like Cleopatra's bridesmaid, boys. What's the insane admiral? The door opens and Rattrell enters, walks to Crystal. You two stay. He points at them. The other two leave the stateroom. What's this, Admiral? I know the gold is real, but the ruby is... Coladas. Maximilian and Carlotta once ruled Mexico. The ship hauling their royal loot sank when we found it. You stole all their jewels? Finders keepers. We didn't take it all. We never do. The last thing we want is to draw any attention. Laguna Beach off the starboard side. All hands report topside. That policy is about to change. What do you mean? Some of us reject the secrecy, the charter. We shall take what you topsiders have. No conditions. You really are pirates, after all. He smiles devilishly. A double knock sounds. You don't even know what's coming. Enter. Chief Fuentes opens the door. Captain, we're ready. Thank you, Chief. Fuentes motions in four sailors who escort Crystal out into the passageway. One sailor on each side grips her upper arm. Bertrell closes and locks his stateroom door. Captain Bertrell, my thing. You won't need them until later. The party moves towards the ladder leading to the main deck. Interior, cabin, Nakima, continuous. Derek stares out the cabin window at Queen Georgina. Tom comes down the stern ladder and approaches. Anything? Cold mortal. Let's head south. What are we looking for? An invisible cruiser. Keep your eyes peeled. Exterior, main deck, Rexville, night. The ship hovers 50 feet above the ocean. Her bow faces a docks area. Off her starboard side is the coastline. Crystal steps down a port side ladder, two sailors behind, two ahead. She reaches the deck, turns, and sees Bertrell. He stands on a red carpet that stretches to the bow. On both sides, down its length, sailors in dress uniforms face inwards. Oh, perfect. I'm going to marry an insane fucking ghost. No wedding today. The meeting. The meet. Bertrell folds his arms. Crystal tries to hide her surprise. Yes, love. The window on Fleet Week is closing for us all. He reaches for her necklace. Crystal flinches, moves back. Bertrell's eyes flash at her. Soon comes the day when you shall cling to me. Bertrell nods that sailors nearby. Two moved behind her. Two more position themselves on either side and grasp her arms. Our surface. I mean, our topside people attending this meeting? Certainly. Bertrell faces her. Everyone else on deck grows silent. Your role, my love, is duly symbolic. First, as a figurehead to inaugurate our new presence topside. Second, as a prize to me personally, you shall have the honor to be my woman underneath. You've got to be. I'm not going any under any fucking wear with you. Crystal raises her arms, but the sailors hold them. Bertrell turns and walks to the edge of the red carpet. A sailor loops a gag belt around Crystal's mouth. Others grasp her legs and arms. They carry her to the red carpet. Bertrell waits for her arrival, then leads a procession. As he comes abreast of a sailor pairing, they snap salute, then drop it as he passes. The next pairing does the same. 
The procession moves past the forward turret, the sail with diving planes, the windlasses and anchor chains. A raised steel platform sits back from the point of the bow. The platform supports a pair of brass poles six feet high and two feet apart. From each pole hangs leather straps and buckles at various heights and intervals. The men position Crystal between the poles. Sailors fasten her legs with the straps near her ankles, knees, and hips. They tie her arms with straps near her elbows and shoulders. A man ties a strap across her forehead and removes the gag. Bertrell, why didn't you take me down in the cabin, tied to the bunk? Don't you bastards know how to do anything right? Bertrell walks in front of her. No one touches you here or underneath but me. We are gentlemen at all. Perverts is more like it. Bertrell moves close. He suddenly kisses her neck. Fucking vampire. L Lieutenant? Bertrell quickly folds his arms. Lieutenant Grenache, proceed. Aye, sir. Grenache clicks a switch on a device. The platform descends. Interior, forward hall, Brexville, continuous. The platform moves down and stops. Two lanterns switch on to the right and left of it. A sailor at each side moves forward to the crease of the bow. They release dogs on a hatch cover near the top of the bow. A sailor removes a wooden shaft from the brackets on the bulkhead. He thrusts an end into the hatch center. The hatch falls out and down. The other sailor looks up at the square opening in the deck. Bow hatch is away, Captain. Very well. Lieutenant? Exterior, main deck, Brexville, continuous. Grenache looks down from the bow point and toggles a switch. The platform moves a few feet past the hatch and stops. He presses another switch until the platform angles forward, approximately 45 degrees. Interior, forward hull, Brexville, continuous. Crystal closes her eyes as she anticipates a fall into the ocean, but the platform straps hold her tight. Beneath her, a few sailboats and yachts sail leisurely. Hey! Help me! God damn it, look up here! Help! Nobody on the boat pays any attention. Exterior, stern deck, Nakima, night. Tom sees a splash and focuses the binoculars onto that area. A cloud of fog approaches. As it moves left, the bow on silhouette of USS Brexville slowly appears in midair. Tom turns and crouches down at the stern ladder. Derek, found her! Found Brexville! Awesome. Wow. Okay, where to? Go south, attack, and slowly. Let's not attract their attention. Interior, bridge, Brexville, night. Grenache stands at the wheel. Descend. Grenache presses buttons on the keel propulsor console. Exterior, main deck, Brexville, continuous. Bertrell goes to the bow point and looks down at Crystal. The ship begins to slow, straight descent. You know Melville, love? His poem, Figurehead. Stop this while you can, Bertrell. The Charles and Emma seaward sped, named from the carbon pair at prow. He's so smart and a curly head, she tricked forth as a bride knows how. Pretty stem for the port I trow. The cruise halts its descent 50 feet above the ocean. Interior, cabin, the chemo continuous. Through the bridge window, Tom watches the silhouette of Brexville descend. Prepare to repel borders. Do we start our run? Not yet. When I say. Brexville stops its descent. What's he doing? Keep it coming. Watch it. Tom points. A Coast Guard cutter crosses ahead. Derek turns as it passes, then straightens to meet its wake. Tom raises the glasses. Exterior, main deck, Brexville continuous. Crew of heavy cruiser USS Brexville, to the meeting. All of the men on deck applaud raucously. Bertrell turns to face the bridge. He raises his right arm straight up and holds. Then he points it forward. The ship moves ahead towards the docks area. Interior, cabin, Nakima, continuous. Through the binoculars, Brexville's silhouette grows. Christ, she's on the move. The silhouette fills the field of vision in the binoculars. Nakima bobs crazily as Brexville passes directly over her. Turn about and get to the channel. Exterior, forward hatch, Brexville, continuous. The ship rises. Beyond the docks area, Crystal sees Queen Georgina's port side. Crystal looks forward as Brexville angles down slightly. She sees Queen Georgina directly ahead. The meeting. Oh my god. This is the meeting. Exterior, center smokestack, Queen Georgina, continuous. Maria, Hispanic, 30s, attractive in a wedding dress, and Wilson, Irish, 40s, in a tux, stand in front of the smokestack. Joe Brooke, 30s, aimed a long lens camera at them. A big wet kiss. Oh, nice. You guys are crazy about each other. One more. Let's both look at me. Real big smile. Tilt your head, Maria. Great. Maria, Wilson, and Joe walk to the front of the smokestack. Rungs of a ladder lead all the way up to the top. Maria, go about five steps up. And Wilson, you stay there, but raise your arms. Not straight up. Up. There. Maria, put your right foot on the next rung. Your other right foot. Good. And look back. 
Now you're escaping. Give him a mondo look of terror. Really mug it. A blue-white flash illuminates Maria and Wilson. What? But I didn't. Maria and Wilson look out over the port side, their faces in total shock. Joe glances over her shoulder. Oh, shit. No. Exterior docks area adjacent to Queen Georgina, continuous. Rexville appears in midair and flashes blue-white. At the waterline behind the superstructure, a black cylinder punches through her hull at extremely high speed. The black cylinder flashes blue-white at the profile of World War II submarine. It slices Rexville in half. The submarine disappears. The stern section of Rexville, attached only at the keel, bends down. She rolls starboard from the submarine impact. Rexville slowly rights herself as she plows ahead. Exterior, forward hatch, Rexville continuous. Crystal screams as the submarine bashes into the cruiser. A loud vibration shakes the ship. Ahead, Queen Georgina's center smokestack grows in her vision. Exterior, stern deck, Nakima continuous. The forward half of the USS Rexville barely skims over Queen Georgina. The bent down stern portion slaps the middle smokestack and obliterates it. Rexville continues ahead, then she angles downward. Her stem smashes into the marina channel. A giant double plume of spray blasts skyward and lights up from the blue-white flashes of Brexville. Exterior, forward hatch, Brexville continuous. Black waves of the channel rush towards Crystal's face. Brexville's hull hits the surface and plunges underwater. Crystal opens her eyes to blue-white bubbles racing past. Brexville suddenly angles up, its forward momentum driving towards the Long Beach Marina. Crystal's vision fades and she blacks out. Exterior, stern deck, Nakima, continuous. Rexville slams into the Long Beach Marina berm. The ship obliterates trees, cars, everything in its path. She halts on the berm, her stern portion still submerged in the marina channel. Slowly, Brexville rolls halfway onto her starboard side. Off to his right, Tom sees a huge wall of spray erupt from the marina channel. At its bottom strobes a World War II submarine. Then the submarine disappears below the surface. Nakima rises and angles sharply down as a giant wave from the submarine's channel impact rolls onto them. Interior, cabin, Nakima continuous. Derek loses his balance and pitches forward. His head crashes into the bulkhead. Exterior, stern deck, Nakima continuous. Nakima pitches sharply up as the wave's backside rolls underneath. Items on the cabin's deck slide to the stern. Tom tries to maintain balance but also falls into the stern ladder well. His right shoulder crashes into the handrail. He spins, grabs at a step, and lands on his back. Derek's body crashes down on top of Tom. Tom opens his eyes. He carefully moves Derek off him and to the side. He checks his neck pulse. Hang on, buddy. Tom gets to his feet, then runs forward to the wheel. Through the window, he sees the wave that rolled under them swamp the docks area. Tom revs the motor and speeds across the marina channel. To his right, a Coast Guard cutter turns near capsized boats. He maneuvers alongside a pier close to the beached cruiser. Tom shuts off the engine, runs back to check Derek, and then scrambles up the stern ladder. Exterior, pier, Long Beach Marina, continuous. Tom throws a line off Nakima, then jumps to the pier and secures the line. He sprints down the pier and turns toward the cruiser. Tom glances at blue and red flashing lights in the city of Long Beach near the shoreline. Sirens wail. Brexville lies across nearly the entire berm. Tom heads up for a narrow gap in front of the ship's bow. He gets around Brexville's forward keel and looks up. At the top of the bow, there she is, Crystal. Her body hangs limply from, bra from a brass post held only by several leather straps. A screech of metal on concrete sounds and Crystal's body jerks as the ship jumps back towards the marina channel. Oh, Christ. Tom runs to a fallen anchor on the berm. The anchor chain covered in muck hangs from the forward deck. Tom climbs up the chain. He winces and favors his right shoulder, but continues up the anchor links. He gets to within 15 feet of Crystal. An unseen force slams his right shoulder and knocks his right hand off the chain. His left hand eventually slips on the muck and he lets go. Tom squeezes the chain with his legs, slides down, then his legs separate. He falls backwards towards the concrete berm. He curls in, twists, and lands on his side with a loud snap. Tom writhes in terrific pain on the berm. Bertrell solidifies just above where his shoulder was hit. Repel all borders, Petty Officer. Your wench is mine. Captain's privileges. Mine for all time. Tom's vision goes to black. Interior, forward hull, Brexville, continuous. Bertrell swings in through the hatch from the anchor chain. As he lands inside, Brexville groans, slides towards the channel, then stops. Take us to Lhasa. Return us home. Crystal moves her free arm and leg slightly. 
People run along the berm and look for a way to climb up and onto Brexville. No time to waste, love. Filthy topsiders are trying to board us. Rattrell draws a knife from the scabbard on his belt, holds Crystal, and cuts her free from the brass posts. We have to get you properly mermaided if you're to be my wife. Bertrell picks up Crystal and begins to move away from the bow. A muffled shout sounds. Bertrell stops, quiet. He starts again. Another muffled shout, closer. Bertrell sits Crystal against the angled starboard bulkhead. She moans and tries to open her eyes. Chris? You here? Chris? Chris? The avenging angel. Come ahead, foolhardy Judas Topsider. Bertrell folds his arms and disappears. Derek appears from behind a jumble of storage lockers, wires, pipes, and other debris broken loose by the cruiser's impact. He sees Crystal against the starboard bulkhead. Chris, oh God, you're all right. Crystal half opens her eyes, shakes her head. Derek steps over the anchor chain and reaches her. No. Please, Chris, oh God, forgive me. I'm okay now. Everything is clear. No. Please, trust me. You can trust me now. Do you understand? Cap. Is Tom here? Babe, where's Tom? The ki- You were right about me, Chris. And I'll do anything to make it up. Crystal's eyes open wide. She looks up and over Derek. Derek stands and turns. He grunts, looks down. A knife protrudes from his stomach. The blade moves up by itself, then withdraws from his chest. Derek screams and falls away. Bertrell fades in above Derek. Blood from the knife drips onto Derek's face. Bertrell moves back towards Crystal. You... you fucking bastard. The ship jumps back. Bertrell loses his balance, falls. The ship stops. Bertrell stands and advances upon Crystal. She moves to the forward hatch and looks back through it. That's a forty-foot drop, love. Better come my way. Now. Fuck you. Bertrell comes closer to her a few feet away. Babe. Move! Move! Crystal looks behind Bertrell and half pivots. She dives from the hatch towards the starboard bulkhead. Bertrell turns completely around then starts to take a step. Gripped by Derek, the wooden shaft that was used to knock out the forward hatch earlier hits Bertrell in his midsection. Bertrell flies backwards through the forward hatch. He screams all the way down. Derek drops the wooden shaft. He struggles to reach the forward hatch. Crystal helps him. They stumble forward. I have to see you. Have to. Derek points forward. They trip and fall over debris. The couple finally reaches the hatch and both look down. Bertrell lies on the berm next to Tom, their faces inches apart. Bertrell's hair is white, his face wrinkled and aged. Died. Out of water. Dry docked. You climb down now. Derek points to the anchor chain. Come on, we have to get you down to the hospital. Take my hand, hon. Emergency vehicles race across the marina parking lot. A construction crane with several EMTs and the carrier extends upwards towards Breckville's main deck. USS Breckville, her stern section now submerged, jumps back, but this time she doesn't stop. The cruiser slides rapidly towards the channel. Breckville's bow slowly rises. Derek falls backwards. No! Derek tumbles and bounces off various objects and disappears into the depths of the ship. Crystal holds onto the bottom edge of the forward hatch as it rises. She tries to climb onto it. The ship's angle is too steep and she slides backwards towards a jumble of lockers. Water completely floods the interior of the forward hull. Exterior marina channel continuous. Her bow straight up. Bruxville slides under the water. On the marina berm, emergency vehicles converge and stop. Several helicopters appear over the area. Exterior, ocean bottom, darkness. From the sunken Brexville near the superstructure, a silvery figure, a neither, emerges. The neither moves around the ship and searches. He makes his way to the bow and looks through the forward hatch. Finally, the neither leaves the wreck and walks out across the barren ocean floor. The neither half trots, looks side to side. It's Derek. He falls to his knees, then forward. He grabs handfuls of sand, then falls forward and grinds his face into the sea bottom. Exterior, ocean bottom, murky light. Derek trudges onward. Ahead of him is the vast sea floor. A few fishes swim past. He walks a few paces more and suddenly stops. Derek's face changes from anguish to puzzlement. He turns. He smiles wide, opens his arms, and runs forward. Interior, private room, medical center, afternoon. From his bed, Tom watches CNN on the room's television. A bandage covers his head. A sling holds his right arm. A cast encloses his left leg from hip to toe. Framed behind me, the odd spectacle of this majestic ocean liner missing her center smokestack. 
State and federal officials have thrown a news blackout over everything, but we can report that three people on board Queen Georgina, and if not for her dashing Navy SEAL Uncle Tom, this Kansas dish would be sleeping with the fishes. Tiger. Oh, God. Crystal stands in the open doorway to Tom's room. He wa she walks in using a cane. Her left calf is bandaged. You big faker. Let's go home. Not for that. Hey, you're limping. Only 36 stitches. Cut it getting out of that front hatch. The captain. Bastard. Bertrell died and he didn't get back underneath. Thanks to Derek. Bertrell dry docked. Oh god, that is the best news. Where... What room is Derek in? He's still missing. Bertrell got him, I think. Almost positive. No. No, no. It should have been me. Me! I'm the one fully trained. But I jeopardized him instead. My partner. I let down my partner. You're actually a hero, Uncle T. You must have trained Derek pretty well. They didn't find Ray? No, I don't think so. Was he here? I thought you said St. Louis. He and his submarine crew intercepted the Brexville. A nurse comes in. Well, I'm going. Where? Hermosa Beach. I'm your nursemaid when they let you out. Watch your six, Tiger. You too. She kisses Tom's cheek. His eyes tear up as crystal leaves. Exterior, ocean bottom, murky light. The silvery figures of Ray, Derek, and some crew members appear together. Behind them glows the USS Dorsalis. I've never felt more alone. I wanted to be dead. Really dead. Our apologies. We had to abandon the area once top centers appeared. I tried to cry, but I couldn't. Why can't I cry? So sorry. Ray, where's Crystal? Topside. We came to periscope depth and watched them fly her away in a medical chopper. Derek falls to his knees and holds his face in his hands. Oh my god. Thank god. When can we go back? We have to go deep for at least a month to rejuvenate. That leaves plenty of time for you to show us exactly how you beat Bertro. You'll learn how to project images. I'll never be able to. You will. But first, I have the distinct honor to formally ask you, Sir Derek Garnett, to join the underneath crew of the USS Dorisos. The end.